ready for the word? Let's just get right into it. Um, God, we thank you for this time. God, open our hearts and our minds. God, our spirits, let us hear a fresh word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are still, this is our last Sunday, according to our lectionary, our last Sunday that we are celebrating Easter. We're still in the Easter season. I know you thought it was just one day, but it's a whole season that we celebrate Easter. And this particular scripture is closing out our Easter season as we move into Pentecost, as you heard Pastor Mike saying, next Sunday, get ready for Holy Ghost and fire. No, I'm just playing. Don't be scared. Come. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> we're going to uh, turn our, our attention to Acts chapter 1. This is our lectionary passage for today. Um, it's on the screen, and I'm reading from the ESV standard, the, the version, and it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself, what? Alive to those, to them after his suffering by many proofs. Somebody say many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What did he speak about? All right, verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, and this is where we're going to rest our time. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But somebody say, thank God for the but. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, the hearers, the doers of God's holy word. Our title today, we're going to talk about times and seasons. Times and seasons. Come on, tell your neighbor, times and season. Tell the neighbor, other neighbor you just ignored. Tell them times and seasons. Times and seasons. If we were to look at this passage, especially around chapters, um, verse 6, you can feel that there's some tension in the story. Can you feel some tension? Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's okay to sit in biblical tension. It's okay to ask questions of the text. We have some tension here. I don't know, can you feel, can anyone feel where the tension is in this passage? You know, these disciples have been through a lot. We've been talking about this all Easter. Jesus literally died. The person who they put all their hopes and dreams in, the one they just knew was the promised one, he died. They were sad. They were taken out. They were hiding. Y'all remember all these stories? And then he's back. He's alive. Like, what a turn of events, plot twist. What? We thought you were dead. No, now you're alive. So now the, the, the disciples have been on this roller coaster. Anybody ever been on a roller coaster of emotions? Sometimes it's great, and then you get some news on the phone, and then everything is going good. Then your car want to act up, because your car never wants you to be happy, right? As soon as you live in your life, they're going to light, right? <laughs> so the disciples have been through a lot we're sitting here with them Jesus is giving all the instructions and they're like cool 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 yeah look at Jesus he alive let's go let's do this um and he's like all right been real cool peace out it's gonna be 
they had some questions. It's a biblical, there's some, there's some biblical tension here. They are having a are we there yet moment. Anybody had little kids on a, on, a, on a road trip? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? This is the moment where the disciples are like, okay, cool, cool, you're alive, you died, you back, you about to leave, but um, excuse me, we have a question. Call on my hand, Jesus. Um, it, uh, before you leave, so are, is this when you gonna restore the kingdom? You know, remember the Messiah thing? Remember that thing that we all came to follow you? Did you forget this why we left everything? If you go through all the scriptures when they came across Jesus, like, man, we found the Messiah. This it. Come on, let's follow him. Do you remember that we dropped our nets and just followed you because we believed that you were a part of this revolution? Did you not forget Jesus? We had hoped that you were the Messiah, and now you're back, and now what we doing? Don't you remember the Romans? Don't you remember how we are an oppressed people? That we are still oppressed, we're under heavy taxation, we're under state-sanctioned violence. Are you now going to restore the kingdom? Because this is what we expected of a Messiah. It's been prophesied all these years that the Messiah would one, come and rebuild the temple, and then two, have a decisive battle against all our enemies. We've been taught this since we were little. We've been looking, we've been reading the scrolls. Are you the Messiah? Or what, what are we doing here? Has anybody ever sat in tension? Have you ever sat in tension before? Have you? I got one witness. Thank you, Say I got, yes. We sit in tension like, oh, I thought we did all the things. I thought we really believed in this. Um, and you know, I can really empathize with where the, these disciples were, especially us as black folk. Us as black folk, we've been asking the same question for over 400 years, amen? Lord, when we gonna do something about this, this situation? When you gonna save us from oppression? When these folk gonna act right? When they gonna stop hating black people? When they gonna stop killing us and lynching us and police violence again? Anybody have these questions of God? God, why, when, when God, when, how God, how? We can really empathize with where these disciples were. Is this the time you're gonna restore the kingdom? Are you doing this now? When you coming through for black people? Can we have our own promised land? Can we get away from these folk and just have our own little country? Anybody, is this just me? I just have these thoughts. I might. I have these on, when you gonna do it, God? They, and I, I love that the scripture is showing this because these people walk with Jesus for over three years and they still couldn't quite figure him out. This should give you hope in your Christian life. We believe in a Jesus that we can feel but we've never really seen him with our eyes. We know that he's alive and he's real. They were with him, felt him, touched him, and they still couldn't quite put their finger on who he was. Could it be that God is so vast? Could it be that God is so uh, other that it's hard to put God in a formula or in a box? So my question is, we're sitting in the tension of this, of this passage. Were they, were they wrong? Were they wrong to expect the Messiah? I mean, our, I, thought, I think this is a valid question. Do you think this is a valid question? We've been through a lot with you. And so you, you, what, we, you leaving? What happened to the Messiah part? I think it's a good question. Were they wrong to ask that question? Were they wrong to believe that he was the Messiah in the way that they were raised to believe a Messiah should look? Is it, is it okay to question your faith sometimes? Is it okay to not just be like, well, say that in the Bible, so you just better believe it? Is it okay just to sit in, in, in the tension of scripture to be like, well, God, you said you're a provider, but my, they about to turn off my, <laughs> and I need you, where, where, fill the gap in here, Jesus. 
See, the, we think the Bible is, you know, everyone was so sainty, and it really it was just they people just like us. Was it a failed mission? Think about it. Did Jesus have a failed mission? Did he come to be the, he did not do the things they thought Messiah should do. Was it a failed mission? Was it something that they were like, well, I guess we got the wrong guy. Okay, I like the answers. Y'all like, no. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> okay. Yes, it was not. The, the whole time, if you look at it, the whole time, Jesus w was establishing a kingdom, but it wasn't the kingdom that they thought. Just think, it's never what you thought. With God is never what you quite thought it would be with God because you can't really figure God out. It's like you can't really put God on your own little thing. You couldn't really figure it out. Jesus came to set up a different kingdom. He was establishing his kingdom in the hearts of men, in the hearts of women, in the hearts of the marginalized. He wasn't building the kingdom. He wasn't coming in on chariots like they thought he was. He was doing something different. He was the Messiah that they didn't expect. They had to do, get this right here, they had to have an ultimate exchange. Lord, my way instead, my way, not your way. God, I want to do things your way, not my way. That's the ultimate exchange. You want to know if you really walk in this thing out? It's when you have to die to your own timeline. We talk, we love resurrection, but we don't want to talk about dying to our own expectations, our own timelines, our own agendas, our own list that we done journaled. And here you go, God bless my little life plan. It was the ultimate exchange. And I love Jesus' answer. It's in verse 7. And his answer is going to help us in our times of tension over when God win, over the timelines of our life. Look at Jesus' answer in verse 7. They said, are you going to restore the kingdom now? He said to them, it is not, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It was kind of like, ooh. <laughs> he snatched all the, the edges. He said, hey, times and seasons belong to God. Jesus essentially said, it's, it's above me now. Y'all remember that viral video? Ma'am, it's above me. The, the, the lady tried to call him a racial slur, and then she wanted to come back and get a room, and the guy that worked at a, a hotel, he was like, ma'am, I'm sorry, it's above me now. It's above me. I can't help you. You shouldn't have said that over the phone. It's above me now. Y'all remember that? That was hilarious. It's above me now. This is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. It's above me now. It's above me now. Those are times and seasons. Get this. Times and seasons belong to God. Come on, say times and seasons belong to God. You got to tell yourself this. Because after you've done your due diligence, after you followed faithfully, they did all the things. They followed him to all the way to the grave and back. But ultimately... Times and seasons belong to God. It's above us now. Now, this is both liberating and frustrating. Can we admit that? It's liberating and frustrating. The good news is that you can lean into the sovereignty of God. You can lean into God knows, I trust God, I trust the timing, God is faithful, God holds all these things in his hand, I believe and I trust God, but it can be frustrating if you have control issues. If you got control issues, this is going to be a hard, this a hard, this hard. Are all the people who have, you know, who are meticulous about their life? Like the disciples, we wrestle with how God how, when God when, and how to navigate our expectation. My question is, how well do you sit with mystery? 
how well do you sit with mystery? <laughs> Sister Daddy's like, nope. Mm -mm. How well can you sit in mystery? So this is, a, this is a foreign concept to us, especially living in this day and age, the age of Google. Now, when I was growing up, I had encyclopedias. So I had to look for stuff. It took a minute. I got to find the A and then go to all the way to the L. And there's a different book for everything I wanted to see. Now we got Google. We got AI now. They out here writing papers and... I could write a whole sermon on AI. No, I'm just playing. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right, write a sermon about the love of God, and I'm just going to get up here and read it from AI. But we live in an information age where we could get things quick, answers quick. We want food? Microwave it. You want food right now? Door dash it. Quick. You need a ride? Uber. Let's go. You don't got to take the bus. Wait for the bus. Who? Let's go. Right? We live in this quick, quick, quick thing. So we don't sit well with mystery. We don't sit well with just like, when was the last time someone asked you something and you just said, I don't know? I don't, good. I don't know. That is the best answer to have sometime. I, I don't know. Why is all the bad things happening to the good people and all the, I don't know. It's so, it's so freeing. I, you know what? I don't, I, I don't know. I sit in mystery. How, how come the things that I'm planning in my life are not going as I thought? You know? I don't know. It's freeing. You should practice it sometime. I don't know. But sometimes God is calling us just to sit in mystery. Sit in mystery. Sometimes we don't have to know all the things. We don't have to know all the timelines because our disciples, our friends, the ones who were in this passage, it turns out they were looking for the wrong kingdom. They were looking for the wrong kingdom. Pastor Mike talks about this a whole lot. They, little did they know that the Romans that they were so concerned about, if you look back on history, that, that, that empire is going to pass away. They didn't even know. They was about to go through it with Rome. Rome wasn't even, didn't even get, they was just starting. The, the, the Jews would, would be expelled from Rome. They kicked them all out. Their, uh, the Romans would come and destroy the temple that they loved so much in Jerusalem. The Romans came and just wrote, they just destroyed that. Christians would be so severely persecuted by the crazy madman Emperor Nero. They were persecuted. Pastor Mike talked about this on Easter, how they were uh, given to the lions for sport and just their, their heads were put on lampstands or to lamp uh, the city. It was a whole thing. They didn't even know what they was about to experience with Rome. And then eventually, strange turn of events, Roman, Rome would become a Christian state under Constantine which was weird because they just, it, you just persecuted all the, Rome, all the Christians. And then that came with another set of events once it became a Christian state. It just became really weird, right? But they didn't even know Rome was the least of their problems. Rome was about to pass away. They're so concerned. God, when are you going to overthrow? When is it going to happen? Pastor Mike has preached to us many times that no, no kingdom stands forever. There's no kingdom that stands forever, which even in the United States, we're a baby kingdom. We're only, what, 400, 200 years into, we're a baby kingdom. We did even the, the America won't be here forever, right? There's times and seasons. They're so concerned, but they were concerned about the wrong kingdom. God was doing something bigger than Rome. God, Jesus came to when he came, he came to tear down the kingdom of darkness. He was like, y'all so concerned about Rome? I got bigger fish to fry. I've really come to do a, a new thing. I've come to come to tear down the enemy's kingdom. Y'all so concerned about Rome? I am over here uh, conquering death, hell, and the grave. I got things to do. Y'all just looking at one little piece. Maybe God is doing something bigger. Think about the thing you're waiting on. Think about the thing you're praying for. Could it be 
that God is doing something bigger. That it's going to touch more people than you think. That is not, this prayer is just not for you. Maybe it's for others. Maybe God is doing something bigger than you thought. Somebody say bigger. See, he was like, see, I know you are looking, you're seeking power. Because if you look at the context, when we get to Acts uh, 1 and 8, which is a famous verse, he's like, I know y'all, y'all looking for power. We look, at, we look at Acts 1 and 8 like, yeah, Holy Ghost, power. But he's actually answering this in context to what we've just read. Let's, see, let's show it. In Acts 1 and 8, he said, you're seeking power? I got even one better for you. I'm, I came to overthrow a different oppression. Verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, uh, ends of the earth. You looking for power? You was looking to overthrow oppression? He's like, oh, I got power for you. You want power? I got power for you. And I love this Greek word, power is dunamis. It's that it's dynamite power. It's not just like like little you know static you know little static shock. Not that. He said, "I will give you power, and it's a different power that's going to help you to be a witness." Come on here, power to witness. They ask him one question, like, "What about the kingdom?" He's like, "Like, well, I got something even better for you. I'm going to give you power to be a witness." Think about this. They asking about kingdoms. He's talking about witnessing. He's talking about being, uh, see, I, I love this. God's marketing plan is so not like ours. I would have had a different plan, Lord, if we were going to market this thing. I would have had like a survey group. We would have had data points. We would have had uh, advertising, billboards, uh, you know, sandals with Jesus. You know, it, it could have been a whole thing. Flyers, papyrus, you know, scrolls across the... God's marketing plan is not like ours. He's like, I, you know, I could have wrote it on the sky. I could have did all these things. He's like, no, this is how I'm going to spread the kingdom. It's going to go from person to person through testimony. Person to person through testimony. I'm going to show people the power of a changed life. That's how my kingdom will spread. The power of a changed life testimony the power of a changed life that's how this kingdom is going to expand it's not going to be some great thing of miracles and things. it's going to be power to change lives power to testify with my life that's where real power lies y'all over here trying to overthrow the romans no 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 it's, it's bigger than that I want to give you the power. And look at us. Look at us 2,000 years later sitting in these blue chairs and watching online because 11 people, when Jesus gave them this edict, 11 people believed God and took that witness and received that power. 2,000 years, we are still here telling the stories, worshiping Jesus. You can't tell me what God won't through, do through the power of your life. We are here 2,000 years ago later because of these people took this seriously. The Greek word, y'all gonna love it. Y'all might love this, you might hate this. The Greek word for witness is martyr. I don't know how you're gonna feel about that. I don't know how you're gonna feel with that. The Greek word for witness is martyr. It wasn't a casual confession. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, I go to church sometimes. Like, yeah, I watch online. <laughs> it wasn't casual. It was the, the, the power to be a witness through your life to the point where I will give my life for this. Like, I, I, I had, I've had such an encounter with Jesus that you can't persuade me otherwise. There's no persuading. You can't make me doubt God. Like I will, I, I will, I'm willing to give my life for this because I know it to be true. I am persuaded in whom I have believed. Anybody feel like that? I'm persuaded. I know there's a lot of questions and what and this, but at the end of the day, I know that God is God. I know it 
to the point where I will give my life for it. Now, we automatically thinking like, oh, give my life. But I'm talking about like power to witness through your life. Will you give your life to be a witness for Jesus? And I'm concerned about this because, you know, if there were some sort of persecution to happen in the American church, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about our level of witness, our level of taking this to the grave. Because, you know, the pan- pandemic knocked a lot of churches out. We still, re- most churches are still recovering, still trying to get members back. If a pandemic kind of wiped us out a little bit, what we gonna do when persecution comes? What you gonna do when somebody, when your life is on the line? Do you go to this church or not? Say, what, what are you going to do when, you're, when, when we're taking people to jail? Like, I'm just concerned. I'm, not just, I'm just saying I'm concerned about where we are in our martyrdom, in our will to live for Jesus come what may. You got to get some kind of persuasion in your spirit that I can sit with mystery. A lot of us are standing in the barriers of mystery. Like, there's just so many questions I have, so I can't really lean in. But how many people will just sit in mystery And just say, I know God to be God. I know God to be God. You can't make me doubt him. So as we close, why is this message so important? If you want to be free from frustration of needing to know how and when, it's important that you surrender your expectations and timing to God. God is calling us to be free. Amen. Can you receive that? I just want to be free from worrying about times and seasons. Ask yourself, what, is, what if it's bigger? What if what God's doing in my life is bigger? And are you willing to die to your own timeline, to receive a new mission and power to be a witness? The last thing I'm going to say is, it's so important to be in sync with God. It's so important to be in sync with God. It's important to move in the time of heaven. You could take those off for a minute. You can move. I want you to learn about moving in the timing of heaven. Say that. Move in the time of heaven. Sometimes we're so concerned about our own times and seasons. It is important. A good prayer to pray is, God, what are you doing now? What are you doing now in this season? What are you doing right now in our church? What are you doing right now in my life? My spiritual father is like putting your tongue to the wind and like trying to feel for the wind of God. What are you doing? Where are you moving? What are you doing right now on my job? What are you doing in my family? It's so important to understand and to seek God about where are you? Because the disciples missed it. They was like, so we doing, what we doing? God's like, I got a whole nother agenda. How are you moving in this season? Amen. It's above me now. It's above me now. Somebody say, it's above me now. That's our prayer. And you know what? It's above me now. It's above me. You can stand. God, I'm trusting you with my times in my seasons. Can anybody say that? God, I'm trusting you with my times and my seasons. God, this is what we want. And we can sing the song we were going to sing originally. Let's just have a time of prayer as we close. If there are some places and some things in your heart where you're saying, I need to surrender. I've had control issues over my life. (laughs) God, I've been so worried and fretful and questioning about what, where, when, how. And God, we just want to lean into what are you doing? God, what if it's bigger? Our reflection questions were, is it liberating or frustrating to surrender your timeline to God? What would that look like for you to surrender? 
And what would it look like for you, you to use your holy imagination and imagine what might be bigger? What are you doing, God, that could be bigger in my life, bigger than what I even thought? And where in your life do you need to receive power to witness? God, I want to give you my life today. God, I want you to know that you can use me however you want to use me. Does anybody want to make a recommitment to God? God, I want to be a living witness, which means I have to die to my own self and my own timeline, but I'm trusting that you're going to give me the power. This power does, is not man-made. This power is not manufactured. This power is something to be received. So if you want that power, can you just lift your hands and say, God, I receive your power. I receive it. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to strive for it. God, I receive power to be a witness, to be a living witness. God, use my life. God, I'm not perfect, but use my life to bring people into your kingdom. Use me, oh God. And God, let me be fully persuaded to the point where I'm willing to die for this. I'm willing to give my life for this. God, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Let's just sing this. Thank you.